Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's installment of our ongoing constitutional amendment series. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the tremendous privilege of serving as Director of Operations and Scholarship for the U.S. Capitol Historical Society. And we are so grateful that so many of you are taking time out of your busy day to join us as we continue exploring these amendments to the Constitution and as we talk about America's most debated amendment. Uh, before we get started with our incredible speakers today, I want to do a little bit of technical housekeeping. You know, we've fallen in love with using Zoom to reach people around the country and around the world uh, with this sort of historical conversation, and we get to interact in some special ways using Zoom. Uh, if you have questions for our fantastic speakers today, you should put those into the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what sort of device you're using to join us today. Now, if you feel like you're having any technical difficulties, if you need a little troubleshooting help with the platform, you can put those sorts of questions into the chat section. The chat is what we use for troubleshooting. Q&A is what we use for the content-based questions for our experts and our scholars. So, with that in mind, it's now also my great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of the U.S. Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, who will go ahead and start today's program. Jane? Thank you, Sam. And as always, thank you for the work that you do to bring these programs into, into life uh, as we reach out to the country. Um, we are now in our series about the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution. Um, what we want to do over this really full year series is talk about the historical context of the amendments and how they've been interpreted, uh, what they meant at the time, and what they mean for today. So today we are talking about our right to bear arms, the history of America's most debated amendment. Few people would deny the importance of the Second Amendment, either as a right or as an impact on American history. But in the wake of the most recent deadly mass shootings and another tragedy on J July the 4th, Americans are asking, is the Second Amendment absolute? Did the Founding Fathers intend it to be? And that is why today the Capitol Historical Society continues our series on the Constitution by analyzing the history, the politics, and the laws affected by America's most debated amendment. We will also discuss the Third Amendment, which prohibits forced quartering of troops. So let me tell you who we have to talk about this. Our featured speakers are the co-directors of the Duke University Center for Firearms Law, Professors Joseph Block, Blo Bloker uh, and Daryl Miller. The mission of the center is to support reliable, balanced, and insightful scholarship on firearms law. Together, they co-authored the Positive Second Amendment, Rights, Regulations, and the Future of Heller. Their scholarship reveals the common misperceptions about the Second Amendment, including what it forbids and what it permits. Professor Blo Bloker is Duke's Lanty Smith Professor of Law. His current scholarship addresses issues of gun rights and regulation, free speech, sovereignty, and refugee law. He is the co-author of Free Speech Beyond Words. And let me tell you a little hot news. Just yesterday, he testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee. So in the Q&A, we're going to talk to him about that experience and what he might predict uh, is likely to happen in the Senate based on the questions he was presented with. Joining him is his colleague, Professor Daryl Miller, of Duke, who is Duke's Melvin G. Shim Professor of Law. His scholarship on the Second and Thirteenth Amendment has been cited by the United States Supreme Court, the United States Court of Appeals, district courts, and in congressional testimony. And so to get us started, Professor, please start the day. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, uh, Jane, for that really warm uh, and wonderful introduction, quite generous. Uh, thank you, Sam, for everything you've done to make this come together without a hitch. Um, we are especially grateful to be speaking to such a wonderful audience today. Um, as scholars of the Second Amendment in particular, uh, to speak to the Capitol Historical Society is uh, a thrill. Um, there is perhaps no provision in the Constitution whose current doctrine has been more shaped by historical analysis than the Second Amendment. So we find ourselves very much in sync with the mission, the historical part uh, of the mission here. And of course, the outcome of that doctrinal analysis shapes the power of Congress and state legislatures to pass gun regulation. So the capital part uh, of the Capital Historical Society is also um, very near and dear to the work that we do. We're really looking forward to, uh, to talking with you all and we look forward to your questions at the end. Uh, as Jane said, my name is Joseph Bloker uh, and I am the Lanty L. Smith Professor of Law here at Duke Law School. And I'm uh, Daryl Miller. I'm the Melvin G. Shim Professor of uh, Law here at Duke. Um, and uh, uh, as uh, Jane had said, the goal of the center uh, that we are co-faculty directors of, the Duke Center for Firearms Law, is to provide a balanced and reliable source of scholarship on the Second Amendment for judges, uh, for legislators, for um, uh, litigants, uh, attorneys, and the interested public like you. Uh, and as Jane and Sam were um, uh, generous enough to mention, uh, Daryl and I are also co-authors of The Positive Second Amendment, which is a book that we wrote after the Supreme Court's first big Second Amendment case, which we'll talk about a lot today, District of Columbia versus Heller. And our goal in this book is to attempt to uh, clarify the legal as opposed to political or rhetorical uh, use of the Second Amendment. So our goal today in the next 40 minutes or so is to try to give you a very brief snapshot of the past present and possible future of the Second Amendment. Uh, and although we're going to spend our time talking about some details of constitutional text and history and doctrine, uh, we expect and hope that this is a conversation that's accessible to everyone, whether you're an historian or a lawyer or neither. Uh, in fact, we believe that this conversation has to be accessible to everyone because Maintaining a balance between gun rights and regulation is something that we have collectively been doing as a nation through a complicated and of course still ongoing conversation about law and policy and culture and politics. Um, we wanna emphasize though that our primary purpose here uh, is to discuss the second amendment as constitutional law as opposed to rhetoric or politics. And that's an important distinction. Uh, there are many invocations of the Second Amendment that are simply political and rhetorical, and those can be quite powerful and not inappropriate, but they're different um, uh, in the sense that they don't have the kind of legal content that a lawyer or a judge might respect. So a good example of that would be um, when people accuse a private corporation, for example, a Starbucks or a Walmart, as violating the Second Amendment if they uh, refuse to allow guns on their premises or refuse to sell guns. Uh, that is a claim with no legal content. It's just inaccurate. The Second Amendment doesn't bind private actors like those private corporations or for that matter, uh, any of us as private individuals. It's a limitation only on governmental conduct. And the Second Amendment, of course, as we'll be describing it today, is constitutional law. And that means that it's subject to a different kind of grammar, a different kind of set of rules of argument than, for example, politics or policy might be. And we think it's essential to understand that um, because the Second Amendment as constitutional law sets the boundaries for what elected officials, whether it be in Congress or state legislatures or elsewhere, can do when it comes to politics and policy. Any proposed gun regulation or policy must be both politically possible and constitutional. So some things that are politically possible, like depending on where you live, um, you know, the answer to that question may vary, but let's say a categorical prohibition on the private possession of handguns, as used to be true in Washington, D.C., the few very minor exceptions, are simply not constitutional, even if they are politically popular. Um, there are other policies which are constitutional, 
but at least so far have not been able uh, to command sufficient political support. A prime example of that would be expanded background checks, which are overwhelmingly popular uh, with the American people and are constitutional as a matter of Second Amendment doctrine, uh, but have not yet uh, advanced out of the Senate. So our goal here is to uh, illustrate the constitutional boundaries, and in particular, and in keeping with the society's mission, to focus on how history has helped shape those boundaries. We're going to focus in particular on two Supreme Court cases, District of Columbia versus Heller, uh, and the case decided just last month, New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. But let's start um, with the story, a somewhat longer story about how the Second Amendment became sort of took its sort of modern doctrinal form. And as is usual uh, for constitutional analysis, we can start with the text. The Second Amendment is not long, it's just 27 words, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, until 2008, the central question for Second Amendment law and scholarship was split between a militia-based view and a private purposes view. So the militia-based view said that the Second Amendment covered only people and arms and activities having some connection to the organized militia. The private purposes view, also sometimes called the individual rights view, insisted that the Second Amendment was enacted to ensure arms for private purposes, most prominently self-defense, especially in the home. Supporters of the militia view tended to focus on the first clause of the amendment and its reference to a well-regulated militia. Supporters of this view argued that the Second Amendment was really about federalism, that is the division of power between the federal government and the states, and in particular here, the division of military authority between the states and the federal government. And although that may seem somewhat anachronistic to us today, a full-time professional standing army was a serious concern for many in the founding generation, and many at the time regarded a standing army as a threat to the sovereignty of the several states and to the liberty of its citizens. One additional area I should note uh, where you can see the framers' concern with various aspects of the standing army is in the Second Amendment's neighbor, the Third Amendment. Uh, that amendment, which as Jane uh, mentioned earlier, forbids the quartering of troops in private residences without consent during peacetime and uh, only during war in a manner prescribed by law, I think shows how skeptical many were in the framing uh, and founding generation of a professional standing army, which many associated with abuse and the despotism of monarchs. They, many at least, had a sort of civic Republican optimism about state militias as being more suitable to defend the, nations against, uh, the nation against internal and external threats. Um, others, however, saw an army as being uh, 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 essential to the defense of the new nation. And here, I think this is where, if you look at the historical record, you'll see most of the debate surrounding the Second Amendment at the time, to the degree that we have such records anyway, um, uh, was focused on ensuring that the militia, the state militia, that is, would have their military capacity and that the central government, the federal government, would not deny the state militia the arms they needed in order to be able to accomplish that. Purpose. Now, this translated into a view of the right to keep and bear arms that was limited to people and arms and activity having some connection to the state militia. In other words, private purposes like self-defense not so easily covered. And that was the predominant view in the federal courts um, for more than two centuries, such that even prominent uh, legal conservatives like Robert Bork and Chief Justice Warren Burger expressed their skepticism of the private purposes view. Now, supporters of the second private purposes view tend to focus on uh, the right of the people in the second clause. Sometimes they refer to it as the operative clause. On this view, the right to keep and bear arms is held by individuals, whether or not they have any connection to an organized state militia. So on this view, the right to keep and bear arms to support a militia is secondary to, or at least on par with, um, a primary purpose of personal self-defense against private threats, for example, criminals. Most, but not all, of the private purpose of those who hold the private purposes view draw a connection between guns and self-defense, not against a tyrannical government, although that is still the view of some, but rather against criminals and other private threats. Within the legal academy, this was initially 
really an outlier position, um, but it began to gain adherence among some leading legal scholars in the 1980s. But again, as a matter of constitutional doctrine, uh, for more than two centuries, federal courts upheld the militia-based view. And what this meant in practice was that if you were a bank robber caught with a sawed-off shotgun, as Frank Miller was, you can see, uh, Jack Miller rather, you can see him here uh, in a picture of a sawed-off shotgun, not his sawed-off shotgun, uh, then you would have no Second Amendment right, no Second Amendment defense to the federal law that prohibited or restricted the possession of those weapons. That was the basic holding of the Supreme Court's decision in United States versus Miller, which was the last big Second Amendment case before it came around to deciding Heller. So in summary, for 200 years, as far as federal law was concerned, at least, the Second Amendment was essentially inert. So that all changed uh, in 2008 uh, in a case um, that was really a watershed uh, in terms of the Second Amendment called District Columbia versus Heller. Uh, that case involved uh, Dick Heller, uh, who's pictured here, who was a security guard at the Federal Judicial Center uh, in Washington, who wanted to have a gun in his home uh, for purposes of self-defense unrelated to any kind of organized militia. The District of Columbia law at the time, basically, with some exceptions that uh, Joseph had mentioned, not relevant here, made it illegal uh, for a person to have a handgun in the home uh, for self-defense. Uh, and uh, Heller argued that this violated his Second Amendment rights. In an opinion that was written by uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, a five-justice majority held for the first time that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to own a handgun in the home for personal purposes such as self-defense. Justice Scalia used a method of, of a reasoning in the case that's often referred to as original public meaning originalism, which asks questions like, what would an ordinary speaker of English in the uh, 1700s, uh, 1791 being when the Second Amendment was ratified, what would they understand these words to mean? This, by the way, is a, a version of originalism that's different than the originalism uh, from the 80s, which was a originalism of original intentions. That is, what did the writers of the Second Amendment intend for the words to mean? The uh, originalism that is being deployed in uh, District Columbia versus Heller is usually thought of as an original meaning public meaning, that is, what is the understanding of um, the people that ratified the Constitution, not necessarily the, the intentions of the persons that wrote it. And in keeping with this method, the decision cites more than uh, cases or statutes uh, or constitutional provisions or law, more history and secondary sources than all these other traditional sources combined. Justice Stevens, dissents in Heller, and he also uses an original public meaning approach, but comes to the op opposite conclusion as Justice Scalia saying that there is not a private purposes um, meaning of the Second Amendment text. Instead, the framers had been concerned only with protecting the state's organized militia military power from disarmament, essentially a structural check on federal power not an individual right to have firearms in the home against threats such as uh, ordinary criminals. The court's individual rights view undoubtedly uh, makes Heller a landmark decision without question. But deciding the right to keep and bear arms protects private purposes like self-defense doesn't tell us what kind of regulations might be consistent with that right. It really can't be that the people in the Second Amendment really means every person with a legitimate claim to self-defense. That would include people like incarcerated felons, violent felons, the mentally ill, minor children. All these people would have self-defense rights, but clearly also do not have 
rights to keep and bear arms for self-defense. It also cannot mean that arms just means that weapons that can be carried. That would include things like shoulder-fired missiles. That would include hand grenades. That would include vials of weaponized anthrax. Arms just can't just mean weapons. Uh, and it can't mean that bear just means carry, because that would mean that you would be able to carry firearms everywhere that you might need uh, to use them for self-defense, including in the presence of the President of the United States or in the Capitol building or other places that are off limits. So who can exercise this right? Where? With what kinds of weapons? These are unavoidable questions. And to that extent, Justice Scalia notes in Heller that no constitutional right, including the Second Amendment, no constitutional right is unlimited. All are subject to regulation. The majority emphasizes in language that uh, is here on uh, the screen that nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on longstanding prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive, sensitive places such as schools and government buildings or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of, of arms. The court further notes that the amendment only covers those weapons in common use at the time and not those that are dangerous and unusual. Justice Scalia also observed <clears throat> that the majority of 19th century courts to consider the question held that prohibitions on carrying concealed weapons were lawful under the Second Amendment or state analogs. He noted that nothing in the Heller decision suggested that uh, laws about storage of firearms of it prevent accidents was invalid, and as if to drive home this point that gun regulation is consistent with the right it had just announced in Heller, the majority added a footnote that we identify these presumptively lawful regulatory measures only as examples. The list does not purport to be exhaustive. So it's apparent from these lines in Heller that the Second Amendment excludes certain types of arms, certain types of people, certain types of activities from its coverage, even though the words people, arms, and bear do not have any explicit textual limitation. So violent felons, people with hand grenades, people carrying firearms in the Capitol building simply are not covered by the right to keep and bear arms, and therefore these regulations against them would not seem to trigger any Second Amendment issue whatsoever. As a legal matter, the Heller decision was a watershed, but it's important to note <clears throat> that as a political and rhetorical matter, Heller simply seemed to confirm what many people already believed, both that there is a private right to keep and bear arms for personal purposes and that many forms of present gun regulation are constitutional. Uh, we should mention here that Heller applied solely to federal regulations. It was, as you recall, a challenge to a regulation from the District of Columbia, but that limitation did not last very long. In a sequel to Heller called McDonald versus City of Chicago, the court incorporated the Second Amendment right, uh, that's a technical legal term, that makes it applicable to state and local regulations. Uh, one of the things uh, that um, um, the court reiterated, however, was that there was plenty of room to experiment uh, with reasonable firearm regulations, as noted in this language here. As noted in the 38 states that have appeared in this case as amici supporting petitioners, state and local experimentation with reasonable firearms regulations will continue under the Second Amendment. So after Heller, one federal judge referred to the Second Amendment as a kind of terra incognita, an unexplored territory. Essentially, the lower courts had two major tasks. First, to identify the variety of tools that Justice Scalia and his majority opinion himself had said are still available to uh, regulators to try to regulate in uh, pursuit of public safety. And second, the method to figure out whether any particular tool in that toolbox was constitutional. The remainder of our remarks, we're going to focus mostly on this latter issue because it's really relevant to any kind of regulations. What kind of, uh, what kind of weapons are protected, where they can be carried, and who may have them. <clears throat> 
So during the period between Heller, which again was decided in 2008, and the decision this term in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, uh, there were more than 1,000 cases throughout the state and federal courts raising Second Amendment challenges based on the holding in Heller that we just, uh, that we just discussed. And in keeping with the court's reassurance that there were still many tools available to combat gun violence, many regulations were upheld. So in cases as varied as prohibitions on certain purchasers or on high capacity magazines or on certain restrictions on public carry, courts generally found ways to accommodate both the new individual right, for example, striking down a statewide prohibition on public carry, but also recognizing important regulatory interests like public safety, as Daryl was just describing. As uh, then judge Brett Kavanaugh put it in a dissenting opinion when he was still a judge on the DC circuit, uh, Heller, quote, largely preserved the status quo of gun regulation in the United States. So just to put a number on that, and these figures come from an article that I co-authored with Eric Rubin of SMU Law School. Uh, as you can see, here, courts rejected uh, about 90% of the Second Amendment challenges that they heard. In other words, in more than 90% of cases, they did not strike down the challenged gun law. Now, how did they do that? What kinds of legal tools were they applying? Uh, well, lower courts maintained this balance or accommodation between rights and regulation by using a two-part test or a two-part framework uh, to analyze any given Second Amendment test. And this is a kind of test that we see in lots of areas of, uh, of constitutional law it basically asks two things. One, whether the challenged regulation falls within the scope of the asserted right, and if so, application of some kind of what we call scrutiny to determine whether the regulation is permissible. So a sort of threshold inquiry, is this right implicated at all? And if so, has the government essentially carried its burden? So the first part of the two-part framework is a, again, a threshold inquiry determined largely by historical analysis about whether the Second Amendment comes into play at all. And just as, as Daryl was just describing there, Heller makes it clear that not all guns or gun-related activities or even all people are covered by the amendment. Some of them are just categorically excluded. Uh, as we saw, Heller itself says that its opinion shouldn't cast doubt on the constitutionality of bans on possession by felons, or the mentally ill, or dangerous and unusual weapons, or weapons in sensitive places, or even the activity of concealed carrying. All those things are just out of bounds for the Second Amendment, sort of in the same way that uh, things like securities fraud or libel fall outside the boundaries of the First Amendment, even though they might involve, uh, in some sense, speech. And at a general level, I think there's agreement on this. I think it just it, it just makes sense. It's historically indicated. Um, I think nearly everybody agrees that there are boundaries to the Second Amendment. Um, uh, as Daryl was saying, it's hard to hold the position that the Second Amendment's reference to arms actually includes all imaginable weapons, or that the people actually means all persons within the United States, like, as Daryl says, incarcerated violent felons, for example, or that bear really means just to carry, like to carry anywhere. And once we sort of recognize that there are limits, that there are weapons and there are people and there are activities that are categorically outside the Second Amendment, the question becomes, well, which weapons and which people and which places uh, and activities fall outside the scope of the Second Amendment? How do we identify those lines? Many people, and under this two-part framework, many courts find the answers based on history. So for example, um, some groups of people and some weapons have, as Heller puts it, a long-standing history of being regulated which in turn, the court suggests, means they are effectively excluded from Second Amendment coverage. So an example of this would be prohibitions on dangerous and unusual weapons, or historical prohibitions on taking guns to places where people assemble for social or educational or political or literary functions, polling places, uh, courthouses, and the like. Those kinds of regulations demonstrate a concern that guns can inflict more than just physical injuries. They can damage the very public sphere on which a constitutional democracy depends. Um, in some recent work, Professor Riva Siegel uh, of Yale Law School and I have shown that history demonstrates a need uh, and a legal authority to regulate guns, not only to protect physical life and well-being, but also to protect uh, Americans' equal freedoms to speak, assemble, learn, 
uh, and vote without fear. And that kind of public safety regulation is fully within the common law tradition that Heller and the court's later decision in Bruin would draw on. Some of these other lines, uh, if history doesn't provide answers, might be drawn on the basis of some kind of implicit cost-benefit analysis or means and scrutiny. So tactical atomic devices, for example, may not have been subject to long-standing historical regulation for obvious reasons, uh, but they clearly fall outside the category of arms that's protected by the Second Amendment because whatever benefit they provide to individual self-defense is so thoroughly outweighed by the enormous risk of harm to others that they uh, present. Now, on the other hand, uh, and this is, leads us to part two of the, of the two-part framework, there could be an arm or an activity or a person that does fall within the Second Amendment's coverage. Many do. Many firearms, most firearms presumptively do. Uh, but that does not mean that they are immune to regulation. And this is true, again, for other kinds of constitutional rights. So again, to use the First Amendment example, political speech is often thought to be the core of the First Amendment, but even it can be regulated or even prohibited in certain ways. Likewise, with regard to the Second Amendment, a regulation's burden on a person or a gun or an activity covered by the Second Amendment could be so minimal uh, that it survives constitutional scrutiny, or it could uh, further such important government interests and so effectively that it might be okay anyway. Way. And this is where the second part of the two-part framework uh, came in. So under this approach, courts would look to see whether the re restriction, the challenge restriction, was justifiable in light of the burden that it imposed on the right to keep and bear arms. This is, again, in constitutional law, often referred to as a form of scrutiny. So for example, as you can see here, uh, federal law currently prohibits guns with obliterated serial numbers. That is not an historical regulation. It's not something that the framers required in 1791. So the threshold inquiry, the step one of the framework can't resolve it, uh, but requiring guns to have serial numbers does not impair their functionality. A gun with uh, a serial number on it fires just as good with, as one without. So having this requirement, you might argue, imposes a minimal burden on gun owners and therefore might be constitutional anyway. So for more than a decade after Heller and McDonald, lower courts sort of navigated this <clears throat> need uh, to respect both gun rights and gun regulation using the two-part framework that uh, Joseph and I have just described. That appears to have changed with the Supreme Court's opinion last month in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, sometimes referred to as NYSERPA versus Bruin. In that case, the court struck down a nearly century uh, old regulation on carrying a handgun uh, in public unless one had a, a concealed carry license and had shown what's known as proper cause uh, for carrying that um, firearm. The holding effectively negated uh, similar laws in states where about a quarter of the American population lives uh, and substantially limits the powers of lawmakers uh, to regulate concealed handguns in public places with this kind of discretionary licensing law. But the bigger question in Bruin was this methodological issue that we've been discussing, how uh, courts should even figure out whether a given regulation violates the Second Amendment or not. Should federal courts continue to apply the two-part framework or should they apply uh, something else? Um, in Bruin, the court was presented with this sort of alternative test that's one uh, that's closely associated with this, uh, justice, uh, ju now, now uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, then a judge, which was known as the text, history, and tradition only approach. And under this test, the judges are not to consider, at least not directly, whether a modern gun law is effective in addressing modern problems. Instead, courts are to use a text, history, and tradition only approach to evaluating the constitutionality of regulations. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, Joseph and I, along with Eric Rubin, who's at the SMU uh, Southern Methodist University uh, Dedman School of Law, filed an amicus brief uh, on behalf of neither party uh, in the Bruin case. We were arguing simply that the court should not um, 
reject uh, the two-part framework and should officially adopt that as the way to figure out whether any given regulation is constitutional or not. A test that we uh, have already discussed incorporates both history and contemporary evidence without relying solely on one or the other. Now, unfortunately, we were not able to persuade the justices who adopt this text history and tradition approach. And so from now on, the constitutionality of firearms regulations like prohibitions on guns in airplanes or guns in the hands of domestic abusers apparently depends on uh, solely on whether they are in some ill-defined sense analogous to a historical regulation, not whether they are necessarily effective in preventing serious harm. And this is language from the Bruin holding that seems to say uh, what the new approach is. In keeping with Heller, we hold that the Second Amendment's plain text covers an individual's conduct. The Constitution presumptively protects that conduct. To justify its regulation, the government may not simply posit that the regulation promotes an important interest. Rather, the government must demonstrate that the regulation is consistent with this nation's historical tradition of firearm regulation. Now, we actually think that this approach was a mistake and will cause significant disruption to constitutional reasoning, as we argued uh, in a New York Times op-ed piece uh, a few weeks ago, and which we're drawing uh, on today. But it's important for us to clarify why we think the judges, uh, the justices' rejection of the two-part framework in favor of a text, history, and tradition-only approach is a mistake. It's not that there's anything wrong with historical analysis. That is a common mode of reasoning by judges. Indeed, as we've already alluded to today, history has proven especially prominent in Second Amendment cases as part one of the two-part framework. Nor is it necessarily that there's insufficient history of regulation to draw upon. There's a kind of um, uh, a canard that gun control is some kind of modern invention that's really only in the late 20th century. But actually, gun regulations of many different kinds go all the way back to the Middle Ages in England, uh, which is the precursor to our modern Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment uh, in English law and extends to today. And in fact, we can begin here uh, in 1328 with something called the Statute of Northampton, which prohibited anyone except the king's ministers or those doing the king's business to, and here I'm quoting from the, the Old English, to go nor ride armed by night nor by day in fairs, markets, nor in the presence of the justices or other ministers, nor in no part elsewhere, upon pain to forfeit their armor to the king and their bodies to prison at the king's pleasure. Now, of course, this is an ancient uh, restriction. We're talking about almost 700 years ago, but it's been central to Second Amendment litigation, including in litigation over DC's um, public carry restrictions. It was discussed by the Supreme Court Court in uh, its decision last week. Um, explaining this statute, the great uh, historian of the common law, William Blackstone, wrote that riding or going armed with dangerous or unusual weapons is a crime against the public peace by terrifying the good people of the land. Now, one reason to focus on the statute of Northampton is that it was adopted in many of the colonies and in fact actually remains the law uh, with sort of remarkable textual similarity, in fact, um, minus the references to the loyalty in many states, including here in North Carolina um, today. But importantly, that history of regulation, especially of public carry, did not end in 1328 or, for that matter, in 1791 when the Second Amendment was ratified. There is some degree of historical lineage. How much of the connection, of course, is in a matter for debate, but a historical connection connecting these early English and colonial era laws to, for example, modern restrictions on public carry. The major colonial era cities um, like New York City, uh, Boston, and Philadelphia all had various forms of public safety laws that forbade, for example, the storage of gunpowder or the firing of a gun within city limits. And it wasn't just an East Coast thing. Uh, in fact, as the country grew, those laws, especially as they applied in urban areas, went along with it. Uh, so in the famous cow towns of the American West, places like Tombstone, uh, Arizona, and Dodge City, Kansas, 
people were all but prohibited from carrying firearms in town altogether. So you could carry them on the range. When you arrived, you would check your pistol when you were in town. And in fact, maybe the most famous uh, shootout in American history, the one at the OK Corral, was sparked in part by the Ur brothers' efforts to enforce a local ordinance uh, requiring arms to be deposited with authorities at the town's edge or else possessed subject to uh, a license. Obviously, we could go on uh, at some length here. Here you can see a picture of the Dodge City, uh, the Dodge City ordinances. Um, historians have written volumes on the topic of historical gun regulation uh, and the Duke Center for Firearms Law, which as Jane mentioned, um, we are faculty co-directors of, maintains a free online uh, repository containing more than 1,500 illustrative historical gun regulations. So there's plenty of history to draw from. The problem isn't um, uh, using history, nor with being able to find some history. The problem uh, that uh, Daryl and I perceived in the court's new historical test is that it doesn't give a good way to analogize, that is to draw a connection between the historical laws and the current ones. Uh, as we put it in our op-ed, which Daryl mentioned, this, it appears that we've got a sort of, I know it when I see it uh, approach to analogy today. Now, to reason analogically is something that lawyers do all the time. It's something that all of us do all the time, usually without actually thinking about what we're doing. Um, but in order to reason analogically, you need some principle of relevant similarity by which to compare two different things. Uh, and in fact, the majority in the Supreme Court recognizes this in the Bruin case. Uh, everything is like every other thing in an infinite number of ways. So green cars are like green plants if color is your principle of relevant similarity, um, but not if your relevant principle is nutritiousness or something else. Uh, and so the problem with the Bruin case as we see it is that the court has left us with very little guidance for determining what similarities uh, are relevant and which are irrelevant when it comes to the Second Amendment. So to give an example, uh, soon after Bruin was decided, a case was filed challenging DC's restriction on uh, firearms on the Metro. And I think when that case is litigated, courts will be confronted with the question of whether the Metro is relevantly similar to the fairs and markets that were covered by the statute of Northampton of 1328 and other sort of historical sensitive places restrictions. How does one even begin uh, to draw that comparison? That, that task of figuring out relevance, I think, is especially hard given the remarkable changes in technology, firearm technology, but also other forms of technology. The Metro itself, of course, didn't exist uh, in 1791. Um, but it's, of course, true with regard to arms as well. So a modern AR-15 and a, flint, and a muzzle-loading flintlock musket are relevantly similar in some ways. Uh, they both operate with gunpowder. They expel a projectile through a metal tube at great rate. They can be deadly. Uh, but one has five times the range and fires 10 times as fast, or probably 100 times as fast, if you're using bump stock technology. Now, in terms of doing this historical analogical reasoning, the Supreme Court majority uh, is very quick to conclude that the Second Amendment extends to modern weapons that were, of course, unknown to the framers. As uh, you can see here, this is how the court sort of squares the circle here. What they say is we have already recognized in Heller at least one way in which the Second Amendment's historically fixed meaning applies to new circumstances. Its reference to arms does not apply only to those arms in existence in the 18th century. Rather, as you can see here, even though the Second Amendment's definition of arms is fixed according to its historical understanding, that general definition covers modern instruments that facilitate armed self-defense. So when it comes to categories of arms covered by the Second Amendment, it appears that the principle of relevant similarity is whether the instrument facilitates armed self-defense. Guns that facilitated armed self-defense were covered by the Second Amendment in 1791. Those that facilitate armed self-defense are covered today, and that's the, that's the relevant comparison. But that's a far more generous principle of similarity than the court seems to apply when it comes to evaluating modern gun laws in comparison to their historical counterparts. So the symmetrical principle of similarity, it would seem here, should be, does a modern gun law facilitate 
public safety. Instead, the court applies a much more stringent test and, uh, uh, and distinguishes away a wide number of, uh, of historical gun laws. In fact, most of Justice Thomas's opinion for the majority here is spent dismissing or distinguishing one historical law after another as being irrelevant to the constitutionality of the New York law, which, uh, which Daryl described. Some of the historical laws were too localized. Some didn't have sufficient punishments attached to them. Uh, some were too old, some were too new. Uh, some, he says, addressed some other specific object of concern, like firing weapons, not just carrying them. In other words, the analogical reasoning performed by the Bruin majority seemed to require only a vague comparator when it comes to identifying the arms that are protected by the Second Amendment, but required a much more close resemblance when it came to accept modern forms of gun regulation. And I realize that all sounds very sort of lawyerly, but what we see, what we anticipate is that this sort of manipulation of levels of generality is going to uh, continue to enlarge rather than reduce judicial power is going to make the future of the Second Amendment a little bit harder, harder to predict in court. So Given the fact that the court rejected the two-part framework, uh, or appeared to, uh, and has uh, gone in on the text history and tradition uh, only approach, we think that a better rule um, and making the law more predictable would be to analyze um, these levels of generality on both sides of the rights and regulation side of the equation. Uh, that is, it might be, for example, that more things count as arms or more people are included in the scope of what the people are, uh, but that there is a, a comparable uh, understanding of a, an enlarged level of generality at the regulatory side when we look at some of these historical regulations. For example, when Justice Amy Coney Barrett was still a judge on the Seventh Circuit, uh, a court of appeals, she had to address a prohibition on guns in the hands of felons. Now, there are not really that many specific felon uh, prohibitors in the historical record. The concept of what actually even counted as a felony uh, was quite different at the founding. Uh, for example, there was no real thing called domestic violence as a felony uh, in 1791. And Justice uh, Barrett, uh, then Judge Barrett, uh, did note that um, uh, founding era legislatures categorically disarmed groups whom they judged to be a threat to public safety. That principle should presumably uphold laws like those that disarm domestic abusers or that permit the temporary, uh, temporary sequestration of guns from persons who may harm themselves or others, even though specific laws like that didn't exist in 1791. Now, whether judges will operate in uh, understanding the levels of generality on both sides of the equation, on the regulatory and the right side, uh, or reading the historical record narrowly or broadly really is anyone's guess. The future of gun rights and regulation in the United States is going to be shaped by analogical reasoning, no doubt, from laws from the past. How much room the Second Amendment will leave for gun regulation uh, remains to be seen, although some of the justice in the majority seemed uh, uh, less than eager to upset the entire balance of gun rights and regulations that are currently on the books. A concurring opinion by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, joined by Chief Justice Roberts, emphasized that, quote, properly interpreted, the Second Amendment allows a variety of gun regulations and quoted this prior Supreme Court opinion uh, that said that a host of regulations remain presumptively constitutional, including guns in the hands of felons in schools, rules against dangerous and unusual weapons. Justice Samuel Alito, who also joined the majority opinion, wrote a separate concurrence, emphasized that the court was only ruling on New York's restrictive approach to concealed carry permits and was not opining uh, on who could have a gun or what kind of guns might be protected. To evaluate other kinds of laws, judges and lawyers and scholars will now have to rely even more heavily on the historical record. In that same Seventh Circuit case we mentioned ago, then Judge Barrett, now uh, Justice Barrett, opined in her opinion that History is consistent with common sense. It demonstrates that legislatures have the power to prohibit dangerous people from possessing guns. Uh, 
Proving that principle is the task of the Second Amendment law and scholarship going forward. Thank you. Wow, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, and let me just uh, set the stage. Uh, one of the things we've done with these uh, seminars is they're, they always end at one, but we find sometimes the conversation is so compelling and our speakers are willing that while we end the formal program at one, we will extend the question and answer period for a few minutes afterwards. And I note that you have agreed to stay with us. So we're gonna start on questions. We'll conclude the program and make sure people know what's coming up. But we invite anyone who's interested to stay with us for a few more minutes because I've got a handful of questions that have come in from our listeners. So let me start with the thing that we kind of teased at the very beginning. Uh, Professor Bloker, you appeared before the Senate. Uh, did they ask you if the Second Amendment was absolute? Or what um, did they say? They were, the, the, the subject of the hearing was protecting uh, communities from mass shootings. Um, so the, the sort of predicate for this hearing was uh, what you mentioned earlier, Jane, the mass shooting in Highland Park, Illinois, on uh, on July 4th, uh, and the center is very interested in what kinds of policies going forward can present that to prevent that kind of thing from happening again. Now, that's going to be a combination, I think, of gun restrictions, but also other kinds of things. And the senators are very interested in threat assessment and mental health services, all of which I think um, are, you know, can be combined with uh, particular forms of, uh, of gun law. Um, there were some questions and some discussion about the implementation of the new uh, Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Uh, which President Biden signed into law actually just two days after the Supreme Court's decision in Bruin, which we were just talking about. Um, that law provides a lot of funding for, among other things, uh, what are known as extreme risk laws, often called red flag laws, which allow guns to be at a judge's order temporarily taken away from a person uh, who prevents, uh, who presents a risk to themselves or others. Uh, those laws have been universally upheld against constitutional challenges. I expect that they, they will continue to be uh, for the reason that Daryl just mentioned. They're a way of identifying people who are dangerous to themselves or others, uh, but there was some discussion of that. And there was a lot of discussion about prohibiting particular kinds of of weapons, um, what are often called assault weapons and uh, high capacity magazines. Now the category of assault weapons, I should say uh, quickly, is a hard one. Um, this is uh, an area where I think there's a lot of misunderstanding maybe on all sides. Many people who want to restrict assault weapons mistake them for automatic weapons, which at least uh, unmodified, they are not. Uh, assault weapons are a, simply a kind of semi-automatic rifle, meaning that each pull of the trigger shoots one bullet, as opposed to an automatic weapon where you hold down the trigger and bullets continue to fire. Now, having said that, um, there are lots of studies out there showing that the velocity and impact and design of assault weapons is to inflict more damage than, uh, for example, your average handgun. They have been the weapon of choice in gun massacres over recent years, including at Highland Park. So the senators were very interested in whether those can be prohibited consistent with the Second Amendment. And so we had an interesting discussion about that uh, principle about restricting dangerous and unusual weapons, uh, which Daryl and I and I just discussed. So I wouldn't venture to guess what happens next. Um, I would say that uh, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act is the first significant federal gun restriction in nearly 30 years. Uh, I don't expect it'll be another 30 years, but I don't expect that it'll be uh, right away before we see another major federal law. And following up on that, one of the questions that has come to us um, is about this whole concept of straw purchases and what is the right of the ATF uh, to come and review your arsenal, if you will, to determine whether what you, what you have is legal to have in your home. Do you have well, any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, neither justify I or Fourth Amendment uh, experts. So this is really, in some part, you know, uh, an issue about Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, when when is a warrant required to come into the home to search for contraband or for um, something that is illegal? I will note that um, this is one of the paradoxes of the sort of militia. 
uh, history, which is the history of regulating the militia was actually quite intrusive, um, including things like, you know, doing a house to house count of people's weapons to make sure that, in fact, people had both, a, you know, a weapon uh, uh, to support the militia and also to have whatever kind of weapon was specified by whatever regulatory authority there was to make sure that the uh, militia was well regulated and equipped. Um, obviously, if that mapped on to uh, current regulations, uh, it would pose a significant problem in terms of uh, issues about privacy, but also issues in terms of um, uh, perhaps the Second Amendment itself. Uh, and so it, uh, the idea of you know, coming to somebody's house and asking them what kind of weapons you have, there is historical precedent for it, but um, it's one of those pieces of history that is of ambiguous um, significance in the modern Second Amendment realm. I guess I would just add on to that for anybody um, who's, who's, who's tuned in, who doesn't know um, what the sort of straw purchaser issue is, maybe it's sort of worth clarifying here that under federal law and under various state laws, there are lots of prohibited groups, that is people who are not allowed to legally purchase a firearm. We've mentioned some of those, that includes people convicted of felonies, people under domestic violence, who've committed a crime of domestic violence, people who've been adjudicated mentally ill, who are fugitives from justice. Um, there's, there's a list of categories, both in federal law and in state law. Um, the way that tends to be, like the way that rule tends to be um, implemented is through background checks. So if you buy a gun from a federally licensed dealer, that person is required to conduct a background check using what's called the NICS, the National uh, Instant uh, Criminal Background Check System, I think it is. Um, and uh, that's, that keeps a list reported by the states of people who are no longer, who are not el eligible to purchase guns. A straw purchaser could be a person who purchases a gun because they are legal, they can buy, and then they pass it off to a person who is not. And a lot of the issues with criminals accessing guns is on the secondary market. That is, they're not walking into a Walmart or a Cabela or a, you know any other sort of licensed dealer. They're getting them secondhand from straw purchasers and others. And so the effort of ATF and others to go after straw purchasers is to try to cut off that that secondary market. That is very helpful. Um, we do one more question in this segment, and then we will go to the, uh, you know, conclusion, and then the the after times. Um, in 1789, which was the year the Constitution was written or ratified. Thomas Jefferson wrote to James Madison that every constitution, every law naturally expires at the end of 19 years. We're coming on 250 years. Um, and so what is your perspective as we look at, you know, the textual analysis, the original analysis, what, what is originalism? How do you square all that with this conversation from one of our founders? I would I can I can take uh, start start the conversation here because in a way, Jane, it's a very nice way to set up one of the major themes of our book, um, which is that the Second Amendment, properly interpreted, and that is with attention to history but also to contemporary needs, I think captures what the vast majority of Americans believe to be the case, which is that there is a right to keep and bear arms and that it coexists with various forms of gun regulation. And the gun debate tends to sort of push people to the extremes or at least tends to amplify extreme voices. But the majority of people believe both those things to be true and constitutional law, doctrine and history agree. Uh, when I was testifying before the Senate yesterday, Senator Cornyn of Texas said this at the end of his remarks, which I then repeated in my remarks, which is that the second amendment is consistent with good public policy. Now people disagree about the exact boundaries of the second Second Amendment and about what constitutes good public policy, but I think the framing generation, just like we today, can understand that, you know, that this right, like all constitutional rights, has boundaries, and this constitutional right, like all constitutional rights, is subject, at least at the margins, to various forms of regulation. No right is absolute. Justice Scalia could not have been more clear about this in, uh, in Heller. The Second Amendment is no different. And so hitting that accommodation is certainly not easy, but we shouldn't just point to the Second Amendment and say, well, this resolves everything for us. It doesn't. Professor Miller, do you have a thought on the matter? 
I mean, I can't add anything other than, um, you know, the sort of refreshing or having a you know constitutional convention every 20 years or so was not actually adopted uh, by um, it, you know, the framers of the Constitution. Uh, there is a mechanism for having a constitutional convention, but it's uh, in Article 5 uh, and hasn't, hasn't actually been used. Um, uh, but, you know, one thing that I think people... Uh, all should be cognizant about is that um, the framers of the Constitution made the Constitution to last. They made it for future generations. They didn't make it just for their generation. Uh, and so part of uh, any sort of interpretive method of understanding the Constitution has to also appreciate um, that the prediction was that this would be uh, a document that would last uh, as long as the Republic lasts. Um, and um, your your decisions about how to interpret it uh, need to be guided by the fact that it's supposed to be a document not for 1791, but it's supposed to be a document for all time. We're gonna get back to this conversation, but we wanna sort of remind people that there are some things coming up that you may wish to join. Um, coming up on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, and Thursday of August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, uh, is a three branches institute uh, for teachers. This is something we're doing with the White House Historical Association and Supreme Court Historical Society, where we are virtually providing resources for teachers who are trying to teach civic education across the country. This is available for any teacher who signs up. Um, so please share that with teachers. You can see the QR code here, you can copy, um, and you can also get any of this information from our website as well. And we already had a brief reference to the Fourth Amendment. Um, and so let me remind you that we're, we're moving through. Uh, this was the second and third. And so we will be on Thursday, September 1st, um, talking about innocent until proven guilty, uh, the Fourth and Fifth Amendments, which have been part of our jurisprudence. Um, and for that, we will be having uh, Professor Sherminsky, uh, who comes to us from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. Um, he is one right now the president of the American Association of American Law Schools um, and is cited by some as one of the most quoted constitutional professors in the country. So we feel very honored to have him. And as we always say to you, these, these webinars and these scholars come to you because of the generosity of the members and supporters of the United States Capitol Historical Society. Thank you for your donations. Please keep it up uh, so that we can continue to bring this to you. So we conclude the formal part and now we go into the even more fun conversations. So Professor Miller, Professor Bloker, now we've got a question, how would you recommend that a, a frontline healthcare worker, a trauma surgeon, uh, someone who you know deals day in and day out with the consequence of gun violence, does the public health perspective have any role in a constitutional conversation? This is a great question. Um, and since it sounds like it's coming from somebody who is in that role, let me just say thanks um, for everything that you do. I can't imagine the kind of work. And actually yesterday at the, in the Senate, we heard testimony from people who, um, who have been close and have experienced um, the, the, the results of gun violence. Um, the specific question was about whether the public health uh, framing has, uh, to what extent, extent it can speak to um, the constitutionality of gun laws going forward. Um, my answer to that would be yes, it can and it must, but that its role is going to be a little bit more obscure now after this uh, Bruin decision, because in this uh, decision, the one that uh, Daryl and I were discussing, the court seems to have adopted this purely historical 
analogical approach to how we evaluate the constitutionality of modern gun laws. And that makes, that at least appears to make the sort of contemporary trauma, harm, and for that matter, benefits of gun use and gun regulation, um, uh, 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 it seems to take them off the table. Now, my view of why it doesn't entirely, at least, is that uh, in order to analogize, that is, in order to compare a contemporary law and an historical one, you have to know something about the contemporary law, the contemporary reality. So the Supreme Court tells us you have to compare the, the contemporary and the historical laws based on their justifications. Well, what justifies modern gun laws is in part the kinds of um, things that a frontline uh, healthcare worker would understand, which is the, the direct impact of, of, of bullets on, on bodies. I would say here just to, um, uh, on the word trauma, you know, the kind of uh, trauma that this question I think points us to is obviously the most visceral uh, associated with the misuse of guns. And according to the most recent CDC data that we have, this is from the year 2020, uh, 45,000 Americans died of gunshots uh, in that year. The majority of those are deaths by suicide. My personal view is very many of those are preventable given their association with, um, with impulsiveness. But in any event, 45,000 gun deaths plus another probably 80,000 gun uh, physical injuries is an enormous amount, just extraordinary. And over the years, it adds up to, to numbers that are inconceivable. Gunshots now the leading cause of death for children in this country, above motor vehicles, above cancer and other, uh, other illnesses. But there is another form of harm, of trauma associated with guns I think we have to keep in mind, and that's the psychic trauma suffered by those who are close to those who are injured or who are you know, terrified of, for example, going to their schools. Uh, if you look at the numbers of students who've been shot and killed in school shootings since Columbine, it's in the hundreds, which is a horrific number. But if you look at the number of students who've been in schools where a shooting has happened, it's in the hundreds of thousands, which is just inconceivable, especially considering how many of those students probably suffer from PTSD, trauma. We saw it from the survivors in Uvalde and Buffalo uh, and Highland Park and so on. So our conception of the harms, I think, have to be broader. And by the way, of the benefits. Gun owners regularly say that they purchase guns for peace of mind. That's not illegitimate. I'm just saying that we have to keep it in mind on both sides of the equation. And, you know, as constitutional scholars who really look at the broader question, um, unlike the First Amendment, the Second Amendment did not explicitly limit its coverage to the federal government. But then you noted that it had to be incorporated via the Due Process Clause. Why didn't the 14th Amendment uh, which made other laws applicable to the states address the Second Amendment. And I'll take a stab at that, um, and then Joseph can correct my constitutional ignorance. So it, you have to start with a case called Barron versus Baltimore, which is a, a decision that was written uh, by uh, uh, Justice Marshall um, of the Supreme Court, where he essentially said um, that the first eight amendments to the United States Constitution really don't apply to the state. So um, at, in the early republic, in this case called Barron versus Baltimore, the default proposition was that the Bill of Rights actually had no appli uh, applicability to any state. Um, then we had the Civil War, and then we have Reconstruction, we have the 14th Amendment. Uh, and then for a very long time, there was kind of an assumption uh, that Barron versus Baltimore had not actually been disrupted uh, with respect to the Bill of Rights. Um, that began to change depending on when you start uh, looking either in the late 19th century or really accelerating with First Amendment doctrine in the 20th century um, with opinions having to do with uh, regulations on, on speech. Uh, and this process called uh, selective incorporation by which portions of the Bill of Rights, not all of the Bill of Rights, but portions of the Bill of Rights are steadily interpreted as being applicable to the states 
through the due process clause of the Constitution really starts to accelerate until today, most of the Bill of Rights is actually applicable to the states with some certain exceptions, including what we talked about today. The Third Amendment does not apply uh, to states and localities, neither does the Seventh Amendment. Um, but uh, the reason why is a uh, really sort of technical and complicated history of interpreting both the due process clause of the 14th Amendment and uh, the Bill of Rights against this backdrop of Barron versus Baltimore. Joseph, you want to add something? No notes. That was perfect. <laughs> and we're going to do two more questions because we we could go on all day, but we recognize that there are limits on your time and limits on the time of our, our participants. But we do want to make sure that everyone knows that this session is recorded and can be shared. It will be available on our website. Um, and that when we send the follow-up note, we will also remind people about the book that our speakers have authored. And so if you really are interested and want to pursue more, that's another opportunity. So someone asked about the new law, the new uh, bipartisan act and the red flag laws. And there are some who have maintained that the procedural steps that are outlined for red flag laws in that act are so cumbersome that it won't really work. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Sure, I'm happy to take um, a quick crack at this one. So I think what the questioner here is probably uh, uh, um, uh, pointing to is the, the the way that a red flag flag law actually works, like the actual process that it contains, raises constitutional questions that actually go above and beyond the Second Amendment. They implicate due process um, uh, because you know before a person is deprived of life, liberty, or property under the Constitution, typically they must be given usually some sort of prior process. Now, red flag laws in all the states that have adopted them, all 19 states in the District of Columbia, permit a gun to be taken away from a person subject to an ex, ex sub following an ex parte hearing, meaning that that person might not actually be present. So imagine this scenario, um, uh, a student makes a threat, uh, they're going to shoot up the school tomorrow, or somebody's grandfather's been drinking heavily and says, I don't have, I don't want to go on anymore. Family members or law enforcement officers might go to a judge and say, look, we have an emergency situation here. Here's our evidence. We need to temporarily take this gun away so the person doesn't hurt themselves or others. The time period, uh, you know, after which a hearing must take place with that person varies from state to state, but about usually uh, about a week or two, right? So there's a uh, the deprivation can happen before a hearing. That's part of the process. Maybe the questioner here is uh, is pointing to isn't that troubling that we might take away a person's guns before a hearing? And I think that is a departure from the norm in due process, but it is consistent with how other forms of, for example, restraining orders, uh, temporarily taking even children from parents' custody when there's a, a proceed uh, when there's a. a, 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 a a judge has been convinced that there's an immediate threat. It's the same kind of model. Um, domestic violence restraining orders work again on the same kind of model. Um, if the question is about um, effectiveness of these laws, like do they work in terms of saving lives? Um, we're still learning a lot. The vast majority of these laws have been adopted since Parkland, which was in 2018. But the early returns are quite good uh, on the evidence, at least as I read it. Our colleague here at Duke, Jeff Swanson, is one of the leading researchers on this. And studying uh, Connecticut's law, which was adopted in 1999, he found that for every 10 to 20 guns temporarily taken away, a suicide was prevented, which at least for me uh, is pretty good, um, especially because these are, again, temporary deprivations. The gun can be returned at the end. Um, but I'll stop here. I know I, I could go on, um, but I had an op-ed in the Washington Post about this a couple weeks ago with our erstwhile colleague, Jake Charles, which had a little more details if anybody wants to read more. And here's our final question. We've Got, and I'm trying to incorporate a couple of uh, questions that people have asked, really wanting to understand more about this Bruin uh, decision. And so think about it in, in three parts. If, if, you, if the court had taken the two-part approach that you suggested, do you think there would have been a different outcome? And if so, how would that compare with Justice Thomas's opinion in Bruin and 
the specificity that he used about some aspects of his analogies and the generalities in others. And how would any of this work with something that we haven't even thought about figuring out how to regulate, which is the three-dimensional printed guns that you now can, you know, make in your backyard or in your back room? Uh, I think that's enough for one question. So, <laughs> Three questions in one. So um, as we indicated, you know, Joseph and I and, and Eric filed a brief on behalf of neither side. So we were really agnostic as to how the case should come out under the two-part framework. We just thought that, you know, retaining the, the two-part framework oh. is administrable. It's familiar. It's the way most of constitutional law is actually done in the individual rights area. Um, and that um, the lower courts had, you know, sort of converged on it as a, a method of administering uh, and implementing the Second Amendment, and it shouldn't have been sort of ca sort of casually tossed away. I don't know exactly how the second uh, the case would have come down if the court would have adopted the two part framework. It's certainly possible that um, the court could have still struck down the regulation as uh, in um, you know insufficiently tailored. Uh, you know, in, in the sense of the goals um, and the way that the, the, um, the regulation was trying to get at the goals were not, um, you know, commensurate uh, or not tailored right. Um, it could have been that it would have demanded more fact finding. This is what Justice Breyer um, dissented on is that he didn't even, there wasn't even a trial. There wasn't enough fact finding to find out how the New York law was actually being implemented. Uh, was it really a, a case where the discretion was being abused in terms of the uh, licensing with some evidence that maybe it was, some evidence that it wasn't, uh, but it wasn't presented as evidence in a trial? And so one of the results might have been, you know, had the court adopted the two-part framework, a remand to lower courts to actually develop the factual record about how the permitting licensing was actually being conducted. Was there an abuse in terms of the licensing? But we didn't get that. Um, I'll let Joseph handle the 3D printer one because that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do it quickly since we're at 115, Jane, but I would just say that this is a, and it's actually a perfect place to end because this to me is a perfect illustration of just the kind of uncertainty that the Bruin case has given us. So on the one hand, um, 3D printed guns are obviously something that the framers didn't comprehend as far seeing as they might have been in many ways. This was certainly beyond their range of vision. So in that respect, this is a brand new problem, um, which we, there's no point in looking for historical analogs, uh, in which case we just have to, you know, to the degree they're going to be regulated at all, it's going to be based just on, you know, essentially the, 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 um, uh, the, the whatever the policy arguments are from the modern perspective. On the other hand, there are those who argue that 3D printed guns are just the modern analog of homemade guns, uh, which did exist in the, 11th, in the late 1700s. At least ammunition, various other things could have been produced at home, and this is just the modern version of that. Now, which of those two things you believe to be true, I don't think is going to have everything to do with whether the new restrictions are constitutional, but I don't think it's in any way really governed by law. And that's the, that's the part that I think Daryl and I struggle with so much. Like, is it right to say that a modern 3D printed gun is analogous to a homemade, let's say, musket in the late 1700s is just a question that the Constitution gives us no guidance on, but which Bruin seems to have made the sort of central question for Second Amendment doctrine. So uh, if and when you all have us back, maybe we'll have some more clear answers on how courts have addressed it, but it's an excellent question probably for us to end with. Joseph, Daryl, you both are Indeed, scholars and, and gentlemen, and thank you very much for your time, your talent. We really appreciate your being with us. And for our members and friends who have stayed with us, bless you for the uh, after times, if you will. Uh, we look forward to you uh, tuning in in September when we talk about the Fourth and Fifth Amendment and making sure that your favorite teacher comes in August to learn about how to teach civic education. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.